Why does AR matter? Ken Perlin. First, I'd really like to thank the speakers not only for inviting me, but also for very thoughtfully providing beer just before my talk. <laughs> so you'll laugh, you won't even know why you're laughing, but it's, it's fine, it's a kind of a very effective augmented reality. Um, <laughs> see? Um, so um, first, I want to start, I mean, give credit where credit is due. Over 40 years ago, Alan Kay said something that I think has affected a lot of people in a positive way. He said, the, um, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I, and I would say that just about everybody here um, follows that ethos, whether they knew they were following it or not. Um, now, the movie on the left is, of course, a very important movie um, from 1957, Forbidden Planet, um, that showed this um, very important scene where this young woman is floating through some mysterious futuristic technology uh, from a galaxy long ago and far away um, through some without actually being projected onto a screen. And as some of you may know, this kind of obscure movie next to it kind of stole the idea and in fact the exact camera shot um, and did well. Um, unfortunately, it's very sad. I wish George Lucas had continued to steal his good ideas in his later movies, but we don't have to dwell on that. Um, so uh, more recently, people have continued this tradition. There's Marco Tempest looking very embarrassed right there, um, who has inspired us all, as um, many of you know, through the years by creating these visions of what augmented reality could be. And he does this very interesting mix of things we can do and things maybe we'd like to do, and sort of keeps challenging um, those of us in the research labs to push ourselves uh, further. And um, this, this tradition um, of doing this um, sort of actually dates back to, actually, if you go back to the 1980s, um, this was from the era of VPL, um, Jaron Lanier's uh, brown, groundbreaking company um, in the mid-80s. And here you're seeing um, the limits of what you could do uh, 30 years ago. Um, we didn't have modern infrastructure. We didn't have small L LED, LCD displays. Um, and yet they managed to make these um, approximations of what um, a virtual reality or sometimes even augmented reality experience would look like using what today would be outrageously outdated equipment. And people have tried all sorts of things and experiments and form factors. This one didn't work out as well. Um, but you have to give them an A for effort. And so um, I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of history. Now, of course, we have this, which is, uh, has been talked about a lot uh, today. Um, although, interestingly enough, one of the people who leads the team for Glass um, is Thad Starner, who has been doing this for 20 years. He started wearing, I think, around 1993, as did so several other people like Steve Mann, um, in their everyday lives um, and hasn't stopped. So um, this is not a new idea. What's a new idea, of course, is getting a very, very large infrastructure, which really didn't exist um, in 1993. Um, of data around this. And what's exciting is combining these notions of I can see into reality with these other ideas that are becoming uh, popular. This is a, uh, a well-known platform that as of today apparently is now almost as cool as a thermostat. <laughs> Some of you got that. Who got that? I'm just curious. Oh, okay. All right, good. Good crowd. Okay. Doesn't... Oh, I see. I... <laughs> Yeah, that's right, yeah. Not enough beer. Um, so, um, but eventually, of course, the technology will move on, things will get smaller, um, you know, the, who knows how small they'll get, but of course, ultimately, um, um, eventually, we're going to figure out things like this, um, we're going to figure out how to put these things right on your eye. Um, now, this isn't as fanciful as it might, se might seem. For example, um, um, here's a technology uh, that's very well established. This is a nanometer uh, scale uh, mirror um, that's using light diffraction to bend um, collimated light, um, as long as it's phase coherent, into whatever direction you want. And this is much, much smaller than, um, as you can see, this is operating about five times smaller than the wavelength of visible light. And the important thing about the existence of these technologies, which are actually fairly well understood, is as the electronics follows along, we'll be able to have something like this 
be able to implement that HoloLens. Um, these, um, some of you probably realize that all of the major companies are working on this and none of them are allowed to tell you about it. But um, they're all competing with each other behind the scenes and when you ask them about it, they all get this look like, what, I, what, what, what they are? I don't know what you're talking about. But they're all working on it. It's kind of exciting. Um, and then eventually maybe you sign an NDA and then you're not allowed to tell anyone. But anyway, it's very exciting. <laughs> Um, we, but that means that we're going to get to this world that was described in 2006 by Werner Vinge, um in his novel Rainbow's End, where he just said, let's just go about 25 years in the future or so, and everybody's wearing. And what he means by that is you pop in the two contact lenses, and what you see and what somebody else sees um, are just completely part of... Now, now one of the things that I... I felt there was a little bit funky in the in the Vuzix video was that they were sort of suggesting in some of their concept videos that within the next six months you're going to have perfect registration and zero latency um, in an optical see-through display. Now, I think a lot of people in this room know we are going to get there, but we're not going to get there in six months. And it's not a question of their beautiful displays. It's a question of a whole round-trip problem with... Um, the tracking, the processing, the image processing, et cetera, et cetera. But we are going to get eventually that six degrees of freedom to within, say, the 10 milliseconds that we need so that it seems locked on. Um, and when we get there, then what Werner Vinge talked about is going to you know, be part of our everyday lives. Maybe you know, I'll put up my hand and there'll be a creature in my hand that's just looking back at me. Um, this is not real. I just went into a paint program and made this because I want this creature and... You know, technology doesn't let me have him yet, so I just pretended. Um, but um, you will also be able to see it because all of our augmented reality devices will be synced. So this isn't going to happen very soon that you're going to have this complete, um, this complete intermixing of the real and virtual, but it will happen, and we have to start thinking about what it means. Now, a number of researchers in a number of places have done lots of cool research trying to figure out what would this be like. Um, and they're, they're actually too numerous to mention. Um, um, obviously, Blair McIntyre is right there, um, and he's been working on this for many, many years, and I'll mention one of my collaborators who's here as well in a few minutes. Um, but so, for example, at NYU, about 10 years ago, we did something we called Holodust. You're seeing sort of the initial stages of it, where we would take an infrared laser and scan it through dust, and every time um, we saw the infrared laser um, lit up a particle, we would flash a visible laser and trace out a low resolution but truly volumetric scene. And now we're actually starting to revise that project, uh, to revive that project, and it's becoming a, bit, a big focus of our lab now. Um, and um, one of the interesting things about this, uh, and there are some technologies that are similar to this in, in various ways, is that you actually can put your hand through these things and start interacting with them. So it's not just a kind of, I've got a big mirror trick. It really has that feeling of, of reality um, that sort of gets you to a certain key level. And in order to understand what these things are like, we've done a number of studies at NYU um, where we said, suppose you actually did have this display floating in air. What would it be like to, say, teach a lesson with it, for example? So there's a project we did um, within the last few years um, that we called um, Arcade, um, which has some cool acronym that I can't remember now, but it involves AR somewhere. Um, and the goal was to do a completely real-time set of videos. So all the videos we made were real-time um, with using a connect, so no post-processing. Uh, allowed. Even if there are multiple camera angles, we needed the computer to understand in real time, it's a different camera angle, I have to move the augmented reality, and try to create a set of, like, if we had the physical subject, what would we do content-wise? And I think I should be able to run this video. Um, let's see if this works. So this is Murphy Stein, who just in the last year got his PhD from our lab and now works at Google Research. Um, and um, he is giving you a real-time lesson about some um, science technology topic. Topographic maps are a kind of map that shows elevation. Let me show you how. Let's see this map in 3D. And let's make it bigger. And let's make it steeper and also add more contour lines which correspond to the steepness. 
Now let's crush it back down and bring it back to a topographic map and add color, which can show the absolute height, which contour lines alone can't do. Bring it back down. Now let's rotate it towards you. And now let's fly over the region to see how the colors and the contour lines change together to show the shape of the region. Cool, huh? Now one of the problems with this, I mean, it was great, he did a great job with this, but one of the problems with it was that um, he, um, how do I do this? How do I get this thing back? There must be a way to do this. Oh, there you go. Um, one, one of the problems with this was that he could only do very simple iconic gestures. He could do simple things and the connector would recognize them and say, okay, I see this is the thing we're doing, this is when we're doing it, etc. Very, very simple interaction. We're, of course, we're interested in going much beyond that. And one of the things we realized during the arcade project was we needed a better way to track hand positions. And that led to a big research effort at Murphy and um, Jonathan um, Thompson, um, um, oops. Oh, I should mention, by the way, some of our co our colleagues before I forget. So, Steve, where are you? There you go. Steve Finer and Hiroshi Ishii at the MIT Media Lab and Barbara Tversky at, um, I guess she's Columbia right now, um, um, are, are all doing this different parts of a big complementary effort together. Um, but now Jonathan Thompson has been focused on this really difficult problem. How many people have worked with the Kinect? I don't mean just play games that worked with the Kinect. So you know it's really the, the original Kinect is, is kind of problematic in the sense that the noise around the edges is almost the same size as the size of a finger. And that makes it very difficult in signal processing terms to pull out the signal of a finger to do hand tracking. Um, so what Jonathan did was he, he went to machine learning, actually maybe I can even start some of this video going, um, and, he, um, and he started and he, he trained a convolutional neural net, a kind of machine learning algorithm, um, to first the easy part is actually pulling out, segmenting out where the hand is, of course that's easy, but then he trained it on about 10,000 um, examples of his hand moving in different positions, and here's where he did something kind of cool and non-obvious. He found a very high quality computer graphic model, that's not his hand, that's a computer graphic hand, and he worked it to conform to his finger shapes and then he used three different depth cameras together to make a holiday, uh, um, a high quality um, point cloud. And he used that as a ground truth and trained the neural net. And what he's doing now is, is, is the, um, because he has a high quality point cloud, he has good labeling data. So he's able to take every instance of these 10,000 different positions and train a neural net, which basically reduces this enormously high dimensional space down to a reasonably low dimensional one. And now you're seeing just a single depth camera, a low, low quality uh, commodity depth camera, basically a connect, or he may have used a prime sense for this video. Um, and he's reconstructing where everything is in real time by going to the model that the computer now knows of a, ha a fuzzy handshake corresponds to these points. And this is enormous. This is actually much better results than anyone else has been able to get. Um, it's much better than the Intel algorithm that some people have been using. And um, so here you're seeing he's now running an inverse kinematics algorithm to fit the angles to those points. Um, and what's exciting about this is that this means that you'll be able to say, use something like the, the new Facebook Oculus Rift and hold, um, hold your virtual hand in front of your face and actually see it, grab virtual objects and interact with your real hand or with a robot hand or with you know, a hand that's a different size or a different shape, et cetera, et cetera. But so the, the tracking is now truly going to be matching the augmented reality. Of course, now we, we're in the uh, Microsoft developer program and he's using the new time of flight connects and we should be able to get much, much cleaner results um, from using those. So this is starting to make some of our research, instead of conjectural, it's becoming um, much more um, um, much more specific and now the challenge once we've gotten that far is to say great we can do that what's what's the um, what's the content going to be now we can truly track hands we have no excuses anymore um, and so and another thing that's come out of our lab just to give you a sense of it's not all about wearables um, is um, we've taken a completely different approach to tracking what's going on um, we built these floor sensors I'll just show you this video um, and this is, uh, this is actually a spin-off company now from our lab, from NYU. Um, and these are actually very inexpensive tiles. And each one is essentially a flat format 
high-speed anti-aliased video camera for pressure. So this piece of surface is acting like um, a pressure sensor that can pull uh, good anti-aliased pressure data several hundred times a second. Ooh, what just happened here? Did, did we just lose the internet? Okay. Um, and, um, and, and basically, the nice thing about these is you can just snap these together and make them as large as you want and cover entire floors with them, and they're getting all this really good quality dynamic data of everybody at the same time. You could jump on them. And so this, this is attracting a lot of interest. I think we just had a Business Week article about it um, from um, people in, the, um, in a lot of different communities. Uh, where, where is it? Is it here? I just lost it. I think it's here. There you go. No? I'm confused. Oh, I know. I give up. Something, something strange is happening. There you go. Okay, I got it. Um, um, and um, people who are interested in um, physical therapy, Chris Bregler, who is working in our lab, who worked with the Olympics team um, on motion capture, and cameras cannot get dynamics if you jump. They don't know how hard you hit the floor, whereas here you can get all the subtlety. So using these for security, where you actually can't put cameras in the bathrooms of airports, there are issues there, but um, you want to find out if the person dropped the briefcase, because it's important. Um, and so lots of, lots of things that you really want to do, I think, outside the box, not just about cameras, but about all the senses going on simultaneously. Um, now, um, this is actually um, going to lead to something very, very... Um, um, simple. By this summer, we're going to have a uh, rollable mat that's basically like a yoga mat that's wireless that you can just buy for like you know 200 bucks or something, and then tile them together because we want to make these as easy as possible for people to find out um, what they want to do with them. But this is this is an intriguing picture, partly because it actually is deliberately um, low rent. You know, it's not super high quality rendered, but what it says is um, is kind of a at some point the gumball machine standing in the street corner is not going to be exotic. You're going to be walking by and that object is just going to be there. I'm going to see it, you're going to see it, we're all going to know it's there, and whatever its properties are, even if it's floating in the air or whatever, is going to seem ordinary. And I'm actually more interested not in when it's like, ooh, augmented reality, as when it's just reality. I mean, after all this plastic glass here, if you showed this to a uh, Cro-Magnon, you know, 30,000 years ago, they would just think you were, you know, doing something. They'd say, no, that can't exist. There's no such thing. This is an impossible object. And yet we take it for granted because we grew up with it. And kids will grow up with this stuff and it'll be ordinary, which is why the research of people who study this stuff, for example, Sally Applin, there's some really important papers, Fisher and Applin, talk about um, when a technology starts taking hold and we all start saying that's reality and where I'm looking at my cell phone, I'm actually there, not here, and how we negotiate all of that. The first generations of these things are always kind of strange and odd, like, you know, people walking in front of cars with their cell phones. But then eventually it kind of works its, works its way out. And there, just for those of you who didn't know, there's an entire academic field of people who seriously study what the cultural, sociological, economic <laughs> implications are of these kinds of um, economically or, uh, so when your psychological presence and your geographical presence start to move away from each other. And then there are, of course, these issues like now if I have to hold my cell phone up in order to see who you are, that's a very clear signaling if I have software that can recognize you from your face. But if um, I'm, I know I'm speaking out against uh, the people who said that wearables are, are friendlier, but if I'm just walking through the airport and you don't necessarily know that I'm face identifying you, there are some issues that don't come up when I have to do clear signaling with a, um, with a phone in my hand. Um, and so this leads, of course, to, oh my God, there's all this data, and everybody's talking about data, and data is everywhere, and it's going to be about who owns the data, and I'm getting a little bit tired of it, so... I'm just saying. Um, so instead of, instead of that, I'd like to talk about art to wrap up. Because I think why AR matters actually has a lot to do with art. So every time you have an enabling technology, so for example, the printing press. The printing press has been around for mere hundreds of years. And that, of course, led to great works of literature, um, Pride and Prejudice, War and Peace, um, 
um, all the great works of Dostoevsky and others, um, the, you know, Edison made just a little over a century ago, made the, um, the camera, you know, the movie camera. Um, and since the invention of the movie camera, we have these great works of art. We have Citizen Kane, we have Gone with the Wind, we have really, really uh, testaments to what's possible when you put a new medium in people's hands. Um, but of course, now we have another one just in the last 20 years. We have the web, and of course, that's creating its new augmented, powerful forms of communication, like for example, Twitter. I just really like this because it just shows it's like the citizen cane of our time or something. I like how there was a pause. I was like, should I laugh at that? Anyway, but, um, but now um, I'm going to finish the talk by veering in a completely different direction. Having put all these thoughts in your head, I'm now going to talk about why I think AR really matters. And it has more to do with the art than it has to do with the commerce, but it has to do with all of it. Um, Here's someone who doesn't generally show up in, um, in um, these, um, these conferences. Uh, her name is Anne Sangas, and she's at Columbia University. And about 25 years ago, she and her research team discovered that... By the way, does anyone know this before I say it? I'm just curious. Oh, nobody here. Well, it was a very important discovery. They discovered that in Nicaragua, in Nicaragua, there was a group of deaf children small children, maybe ages three to eight, who had not received any um, formal education in language. Um, and what she found out that these children, she's a linguist, and she discovered what they had done is they had created their own sign language, which is now called Nicaraguan Sign Language. And as far as anybody can tell, they had created it spontaneously, very, very rapidly, within about a year or so. And when linguists studied this language, they found out that this language created by little children has as sophisticated a grammar and a set of tenses and a set of you know verb noun rules etc as all other natural languages this has been found in other places before it was found in Hawaii when there were migrant workers who had no language in common and their children spontaneously created a natural language which was discovered to be as sophisticated as natural languages so when you now read the work of evolutionary linguists and they try to understand how did we get language um, the consensus among the experts is that language is literally invented by children. Ch childhood and language, a natural language, are a co-evolution. And actually, we lose the ability once we get to about eight or nine or something. Um, there are structures in little kids' brains that kind of go away that make them really good at generating language and grammar. Um, and this kind of makes sense because you couldn't actually have language pass on unless it was something that was very, very easy for little. And those of you who have little kids are experiencing this right now. It's like it's eerie what they're doing with language that you're saying, wow, I could never do that. Um, learn that many words a day. And so the reason this matters for us is that at some point in the next few decades, when I make a gesture, that gesture, it's going to be as ordinary as a gumball machine on the street. That gesture will just turn into something that floats in the air. And we'll all be able to see it. And it'll be part of our visible culture, just as when I make marks on paper now or I write on a whiteboard, that's part of a visual culture. Little kids will do things with this that we can't even imagine. They will start embracing it and it'll become part of their creation of natural language. And the really interesting future of augmented reality in the long term of humanity doesn't actually belong to us, it belongs to them. And we should be paying attention to that. So, thank you. Thank you.